Somewhere between 200 and 350 million EVs. That's how many will be on the road by 2030. And today, that number is just 16.5 million. So we've got a lot of batteries that we need to build in not that much time. And that doesn't even consider what we need for stationary storage. So if you watch the word battery, it's either the devil or the holy grail. What about the raw materials? Well, yes, what about the raw materials and indeed the rest of the supply chain? And if the semiconductor chip shortage is anything to go by, which now means a three month to two year waiting time on a brand new electric vehicle, we have a lot of work to do to ensure that history doesn't repeat itself for batteries. So I'm here to do some research and call upon some experts to find out what is going on with batteries. Can the supply chain cope? Are batteries as good or as bad as people say? And should we be worried about it? Well, this is Robert's studio that we've hijacked and this is The Fully Charged Show. Like The Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia on March the 11th and 12th. Before we get started, we thought it'd be useful to have a bit of a primer on batteries. So what actually is a battery? Well, in an electric vehicle, you will have a battery pack and inside that battery pack is where the magic happens. So in a battery cell, you've got a cathode, an anode and a separator. And charged ions, normally lithium, travel from cathode to anode when the battery is charging and electrons travel in an external circuit and the reverse happens when the electric vehicle is in motion. So lithium goes from anode to cathode and the electron joins it by going in an external circuit. And how well that happens depends on the overall performance characteristics of your battery cells. And that's dependent on the materials that you've got inside that cathode. So there are a lot of materials in a battery, but we're gonna focus on the really big hitters. So the one that most people have heard of, lithium. Now there's about five kilos in a battery pack and lithium is found in a rock called spodumene. Alternatively, it's found underground in this sort of briny solution that gets pumped to the surface and separated via evaporation. Lithium is used because it's light and it's easy to make its electron move in a circuit. Now the other materials in a cathode depend on the chemistry, so you might have heard of the term NMC. That means that you've got nickel, manganese and cobalt. About 35 kilograms of nickel, 20 kilograms of manganese and 14 kilograms of cobalt. Now the biggest reserves of cobalt are found in the Democratic Republic of Congo and we will be coming onto that a little bit later on. But the other increasingly big chemistry is LFP, so lithium iron phosphate. Now iron is the most abundant material on earth by mass, it's about 80% of the earth's crust, but of course extracting it is, you know, another thing. The other notable chemistries are LMO, LCO and NCA. And what a cell manufacturer chooses for that cathode material really depends on what they want the battery to do. So is that prioritizing high energy density, high power density, uh, lifetime, cost, safety? Um, and that's why NMC has traditionally been really popular because it has a really high energy density and therefore range versus something like LFP, which is cheaper, but maybe doesn't have quite as a high energy density. And on the other side, in the anode, we've got about 70 kilos of graphite in the entire battery pack. So about the average size of a grown person. So a real chemistry cookbook. And if you follow the news, you'll know that some of the price of these raw materials has been going absolutely bonkers. So I want to speak to Benchmark Mineral Intelligence to find out what exactly is going on. What we've got is extremely strong growth in the battery markets, particularly electric vehicle segment. Uh, and we're not necessarily seeing raw materials able to keep up with that demand. So as a consequence, we've got a tightness in raw material supply and we've got elevated prices for quite a few of those materials. And let's stick with lithium as a, the kind of example here. To meet EV projected demand, how much more lithium do we need? Well, um, we're, we're talking in the order of millions of tonnes uh, of lithium is going to need to be built out over the next couple of decades. And, and, you know, bear in mind, this was a market that until quite recently wasn't even a million tonnes itself. So it, it's magnitudes and magnitudes of growth that are going to be needed to satisfy demand. Um, and, and that's just because of the sheer growth that we're seeing in the battery market. Um, by 2030, we think battery demand is going to be 400% higher than it is at the moment. Wow. And so let's assume we did absolutely nothing, no new mines open. When would we have a battery shortage? 
Well, I guess you, you have a battery shortage uh, as soon as you've got a raw material shortage, really. Um, and at, at the moment, we, we, we're, our assessment is that lithium is currently in a deficit at the moment, and, and hence that's why we've got such elevated prices. And we're expecting deficits to start emerging in graphite from next year. For nickel and cobalt, um, those markets are of less concern at the moment. The, the investment into those two metals has been very substantial, particularly in Indonesia. And so for nickel and cobalt, we're not likely to see some deficits emerging until around about the early 2030s. What kind of represents the biggest bottleneck to, to unlocking that, that supply? Pure and simply, it's um, it's adequate access to mined materials, uh, and all of this boils down to the fact that to open a new mine, it, it's a really time-consuming process. Um, it, it takes anything from five to twenty-five years to open a new mine. If you compare that to other parts of the battery supply chain, building out a cathode facility, building a gigafactory itself, they're more on the order of two to five years. So. Yeah, those parts of the market are able to respond much more quickly to the fact that demand is rising so, so fast at the moment. So it seems we have a bit of a perfect storm, massively growing demand, not enough mining and refining of raw materials, and prices going absolutely mad as a consequence. And particularly because the supply chain is dominated in just a bunch of locations, and particularly in China. And in fact, according to the International Energy Agency, China is responsible for three quarters of global battery cell production capacity and cathode and anode material production. Over half of global raw materials processing for lithium, cobalt and graphite also occurs in China. So whilst Europe might be responsible for about a quarter of electric vehicle production, it holds very, very little of the overall battery supply chain. And it's kind of obvious really, so China is home to over half of the world's electric vehicles and it all stems back to its 10 cities, 1000 vehicles strategy that it launched in 2009, where it identified new energy vehicles, including electric vehicles, as its route to global auto domination. And the rest of the world is now playing catch up and scrambling to build this much more diverse battery supply chain. The US, for example, has mandated that increasing amount of battery materials need to be made domestically in the US, and that is starting to have an impact. Um, Snow Lake Lithium is a Canadian-based uh, lithium uh, exploration resource, um, and our stated ambitions is to be able to facilitate the green energy transition that we're currently uh, is underway, and we'd like to manifest that manifest that in a way that can be carbon neutral and that's um, congruent with the philosophy of what the EV transition wants to achieve. So actually, mining lithium, but in a really environmentally friendly way. And so, when the mine in Canada comes online, how many electric vehicles do you anticipate it supporting? So um, I think our initial projections show that um, at least in the first phase, we'll be able to supply about the, the raw material for about 500,000 cars per year. Um, and we're looking at a 10 year uh, lifespan at the moment based on our current uh, resource definition. So we're looking at, you know, 5 million cars, um, which ultimately is, um, is an impact, but a lot of work that still needs to be done across the, the, the global ecosystem to, to really help us get to that point where we're all driving electric vehicles. And in terms of where you are in your journey between sort of now and actually having lithium out of the ground process and in electric vehicle, how long will that process take, do you think? Today in North America, the sum total of lithium is, is effectively zero. There's one small operation in Nevada, but there's effectively zero lithium. And that's the cr key critical component uh, of making this happen. So we're very cognizant of the responsibility of that. So we're trying to accelerate as quickly as possible. We're very hopeful and optimistic that by 2025, um, slash 26, we should be commissioned uh, and, and in production. There are still hurdles that exist that prevent this from being a very, very kind of smooth process. So if you had a magic wand and you could wave all of those hurdles out of the way, what would they be? The biggest challenge is comprehension. It's really that people need to understand how critical mining is. It's easy to sit there and criticize um, mining. Um, and some of it is, is, is earned by, by the mining community over its history. But the fact is, we need mining. Mining is, is, is going to make energy transition possible. Mining makes everything in our lives possible. 
So we can't just ignore it. We just have to deal with it. And, and that, and like I said, in a responsible fashion. So if I had a magic wand, a lot of, I, I would certainly sprinkle a lot of comprehension across the, you know, the, the government, across the populations so that people can understand, come to terms and deal with it in that type of fashion that we, uh, it, it, with, with the know-how that we have today. Snow Lake Lithium isn't the only one to create these new mines and new locations to diversify this supply chain. And there have been a myriad of other announcements, both on the mining, refining, and on the Gigafactory side. But the real question is, is there enough raw materials? Well, to answer that, I'm gonna have to go back to Jessica. Jessica, it's, it's me again. I forgot to ask some quite fundamental questions, including the big trillion dollar question, have we actually got enough raw materials to meet future EV demand? We have enough raw materials in the ground. We have enough raw materials in recycling. But whether we've got the capability to extract those and refine them and provide them at the moment, no, there isn't the capacity. And we are seeing that addressed. If you look at the US, they released the Inflation Reduction Act, which is providing a lot of stimulus and, and, and tax advantages for companies that make batteries with domestic raw materials in them. Um, but, but some would say it, it's too little, too late really to meet the targets uh, that they've set in stone for electric vehicles. So there could be enough, but it is entirely contingent on the upstream side of things coming online exceptionally quickly. So that's the mining and refining of materials. And automakers are clearly worried about this, so much so that some of them are choosing to make supply deals directly with the mines. However, any extraction process, not just for electric vehicles, is intensive on the environment and, of course, the communities that sit alongside them. We are all too familiar with the appalling images of child labour in the Democratic Republic of Congo for the mining of cobalt. The images of which, of course, sparked outrage and scepticism that batteries have an awful impact up and down their supply chain. So is this changing and how can battery makers, automakers and drivers be sure that their batteries don't have an enormous impact and are indeed ethical? So I think the number one thing that Circular does is it provides visibility end to end of supply chains. In this case, battery supply chains. We track physical material, either from raw material or recycled material through the processing as it transforms into a battery component, battery cell, battery pack. So then we can create a provenance and proof of uh, origin of the minerals and the materials that are used in our batteries. Now, I would say that that's really the backbone, right? And that's creating visibility, that's creating accountability, it's creating networks and linkages between our supply chain participants. Now, on top of that, we can add additional data, say embedded carbon, um, proof of responsible, sustainable sourcing, other maybe upstream uh, certificates in terms of IRMA or copper mark that can be attributed not to the factory or the company, but to the product itself. So then it can carry through to the end product and communicate it to the customer. I imagine when you tell people what you do, mm. and for people who are maybe less familiar with, with the industry, they'll say to you, what about child labor in the DRC and is that kind of representative of the industry as a whole. What, what do you say to those sorts of comments? The fact is, is that we're building a brand new global supply chain to electrify our transportation and power generation economies. And that is going to be a journey. I think that the global supply chain has been built organically to date. And some of the policies we're talking about, the EU battery regulation, the clean vehicle tax credit, the efforts by various players within the industry that they say, I want economic uh, certainty, energy security of my value chain. And so I'm going to go seek this proof and this accountability. And that's going to change the game. Um, so if I was like an automaker or a battery manufacturer, how would I be sure that actually my batteries are OK from an emission standpoint or from a, you know, the working conditions for the people actually doing the mining? Um, how does that work with working with an organization like yourself? I think what we're seeing right now is that um, you know, the end customer is increasingly accountable for all activity that's happening beyond their control. And that really doesn't have to be the case. If you create visibility of the supply chain, 
upstream, create linkage, and then create continuous visibility of that activity so it stays in line towards, towards those uh, standards and qualities you're looking for. So clearly stuff like battery passports and whole life cycle assessments are going to give us that visibility up and down the supply chain which hopefully makes people much more accountable and make these batteries much less impactful on the planet and communities. But interestingly though, according to this carbon counter from MIT, we'll put the link in the notes, even considering production and extraction materials Electric vehicles are still less carbon intensive than internal combustion engine vehicles over their whole lifetime. Still, a greener future isn't run without its challenges, but perhaps raising awareness about some of these challenges means we can start addressing them. And really, really importantly, unlike fossil fuels, which, by the way, are extremely carbon intensive to extract and have a whole host of social and political challenges attached to them as well, electric vehicles and their whole supply chain can be decarbonized. And really, really, really importantly, the raw materials can be recycled. Companies like Redwood Materials are recovering up to 95% of the raw materials contained within batteries. But as we've mentioned, different materials have different properties, which means that in theory, we could be way more strategic about which materials go where and for what applications. Earlier this year, we visited a company called Faradian and they're making sodium ion batteries instead of lithium ion batteries. And whilst they're not as energy dense, so wouldn't be good for like a performance car, could be really good for something like stationary energy storage. And there's a load of other cool stuff as well, like sand batteries in Finland or gravity batteries using concrete blocks and a load of other stuff that are batteries but don't look like batteries. But surely we haven't reached the pinnacle of battery technology and there must still be so many ways that they could be made more efficient. Well, it's on this note that I'm going to speak to someone who I have to caveat, I do know quite well. He is actually my husband, uh, but he does something with anodes. So we are trying to increase energy density of cells by introducing silicon as a material into the anode component of lithium ion cells. And I mean, how much more efficient could they be made if that works? Uh, so at the moment, we've been able to demonstrate a near enough 50% increase in energy density for the same volume. So if you've got a typical 18650 cell, um, we can cram in up to 50% more energy just by dropping in our material. This seems like a really obvious solution, but presumably it must be pretty difficult. Yeah, well, when you're trying to introduce something at a material level, you're really engineering at the nanoscale. Um, we're trying to fuse materials at such a small level. And the reason that we're doing that is because we're trying to uh, mitigate against silicon's desire to expand and contract under charge and discharge. Um, so when you're engineering at the nanoscale, it just becomes that much harder to to try and engineer at that level because we can't actually see it. And so what difference could that have on the supply chain? How could it alleviate some of those pressures that we're seeing? So if you think about it from the application level, um, you've got an electric car, um, you've got a battery pack, it goes 300 kilometers. We can potentially reduce the size of that battery pack by up to 33%-ish um, by delivering that 50% increase in energy density. So if you're using 33% less cells using 33% less materials, um, you're shipping 33% less materials, mining less, or rather making what we mine from the earth last that little bit longer. It's worth noting that there are of course low-tech versions available as well. We could make buses and trains much more affordable and that would reduce the number of electric vehicles that we need on the road. And that's the issue. There are a lot of cars on the road and if they all had to be electric tomorrow, we would have a substantial problem. But it's weird, any time there is a supply and demand issue, things get political and motivated by forces beyond just wanting to do good. 
we tend not to care until there is a financial imperative to do so. And now we're playing dramatic catch up to meet this future electric vehicle demand. The technology exists, the materials exist, the appetite for electric vehicles exists. All that we're waiting for now is the right policies and funding to make sure that we have the supply of materials so that we don't have this this shortage or massive fluctuations in price. So global leaders, over to you. Um, so if you'd like what you saw today, please do like, comment and subscribe and tell us where we've missed information. Um, it really, really helps us create future episodes. And if you have been, thanks for watching.